So, how's everybody doing today? <laughs> you are a good bunch of folks, I tell you what. Because God is good. Yeah. Amen. All the time. <laughs> I think everybody in this room has lost somebody to sickness. Everybody here has been through that. The older you are, the more likely it is that there's been a loved one that you prayed for, that you believed God for, but they passed. And it leaves us as Christians with a choice when that happens. We can seek to understand we can assume that God doesn't heal today, or we can get bitter at God. But today I want to talk about a better option, and not focusing so much on unanswered prayer, not focusing so much on the bad memories of walking through a, a long illness with somebody, especially if you were believing that God was going to heal them. I want to tell you something. I still maintain that, first of all, God doesn't make people sick. Amen. Second of all, that God desires for us to be well. Yes. And that God heals in response to faith. Amen. There's a bit of a dichotomy involved when it comes to healing, isn't there? Yes. We've seen too many uh, examples of the miraculous. We've talked to people. We've known people that give their testimony. Hey, doc doctor gave me no hope, and here I am 10, 20 years later, right? Yeah. Seen enough answers to prayer to keep on believing. I've seen enough miracles in my life to keep believing that God is a God of miracles, that that all didn't stop. I've learned that I have to believe the Word of God more than I believe my emotions. I have to believe the Word of God more than I believe other people, some of them very well-meaning. But a lot of times, especially if you have gone through a situation in your family where you've had repeated losses and sometimes you just go, why me? Why me? This is a reality that it happens. You can get jaded. And sometimes well-meaning church people don't help when they tell you, well, if you just would have had more faith. See, and here's, here's the problem. We say it's all by grace. And then very quickly we want to turn it around and make it look like it's something that we brought to the table. Amen. And that's dangerous ground. That's right. So what do we do with this? How do we, how do we get a hold of this? How do we walk forward in this? How do we understand God's will and, and maybe to understand why things don't always turn out the way that we think they should? Well, let me just tell you this, and I've shared this before and I'll say it again. It's okay for you to have a disagreement with God, but let me just remind you of something. You may disagree, but He's right. He's right. And we may not always get it, but He's right. But listen, I firmly believe He is not trying to withhold information from us. He's not asking for blind obedience and says, you just be quiet and live your life, peon. No, he says, I love you so much that I want to help you through this, and I want to change your mind about how you think about this. And there's no quick answers. The other week when we were up on campus handing out pizza, one young lady came up and she said, well, I'm atheist. But tell me about why you do this and what you do. And it was an interesting conversation. Pastor Dale from the Nazarene Church, when she said that, he came up, put his arm around me. <laughs> I don't know what he thought I was going to do. 
But I, I said, well, I'd, lo- I'd love to, let's talk about this. And, and another pastor there said, I'm just curious, what made you decide that there was no God? And she said, children with cancer. And there's no five-second answer to that. There's a long version. And I want to start getting into a little bit of the long version today, but we're not going to cover everything. We're not going to cover everything. I don't have all the answers. That feels good just to say that. Maybe you ought to try that sometime. Just say, I don't have all the answers. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? But we know the one who does have all the answers. And he wants us to get as close as we have decided that we will let ourselves get. He wants to teach us. He wants us to grow. He wants us to learn. He wants us to be more like Jesus. This is all part and parcel of what it meant when Jesus went to the cross. It's not slide into heaven by the skin of your teeth. It's we start living heaven now. Eternity starts the moment that you're born again. And while it is true that someday when we are without this flesh, that we will understand these things. There are things that we will go into glory with that are still unanswered. And we do know, thank God, that someday even those things will be clear. You know, we, we say stupid things. I say plenty of stupid things. Uh, one of them is, boy, I've got a lot of questions for God when I see Him. I don't think I'm going to need to ask a thing. I believe we will know. We will understand. But it doesn't mean that in this life we just, we just uh, turn our brains off, turn our spirits off, and don't come into a deeper level of fellowship and understanding with God through the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, if you're born again, lives inside you. That's how much God loves you. He took up residence within you, in your spirit. Pretty cool. I, I, I didn't have time on campus to really go down the trail, but we just said, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. I found it interesting that the uh, pastor from Messiah Methodist Church engaged her further in conversation and said, uh, so it's kind of hard to be mad at somebody that doesn't exist though, right? (laughs) And she said, okay, so he exists. I just don't see eye to eye with him. (laughs) Which was honest, right? (laughs) Sickness entered the world with sin. It was not God's idea, right? It was not God's idea. I do not believe that he created man to die. But sin entered the world. How? The choice that Adam and Eve made. If God had not extended a choice to follow him or to not follow him, it would not have been love. It would have been control. And God created the animals with instinct. They didn't have a choice. They just do what, they're, what the instinct tells them to do. But with, with mankind, it was different. He wanted relationship. And when that relationship was destroyed through years and years of sin and disobedience, he didn't give up. He said, I'm going to come down there myself. And I'm going to pay the penalty that you can't pay so that you can be free. So from the get-go, we have to understand that God is not making people sick. It was not his idea for people to be ill and, and all of this. But we live in a fallen world, right? We live in a fallen world. Even though there's hope because of Jesus, sin entered the world. And through the years, it, got, it gets worse. So DNA, I, I did a DNA uh, thing where you take you spit in the tube and send it off, right? And big surprise, I'm mostly German and, and Western European, 
And there's a 1% Jewish in there, which I thought was kind of cool. And there's a little bit of Native American in there. And I'm thinking, well, if your surroundings affect your DNA, certainly sin gets into your DNA and rebellion and disobedience. You multiply that over time, and it's no wonder we have sickness. It's no wonder we have uh, illnesses that are follow uh, heredity. It's no wonder. It's a wonder any of us can actually put one foot in front of the other and walk, but by the grace of God. So, we, we can't look at why this person uh, wasn't healed, that it was because of their personal sin, although certainly sometimes sin leads to sickness and death directly. But it's through this human race that has been polluted with rebellion against God. So it might not be my sin, and it might not be your sin, and it may, may not be Aunt Sally's sin that brought the sickness, but sin in general has affected humanity ever since the fall in the garden. But there's good news. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's hope. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that there's hope. But by these two verses, are we to accept by this that Jesus only paid the price for sin sickness? Are we to assume that, that all of the work that Christ did on the cross was only, only, it's a big only, but only so that we could be forgiven and made the new creatures? Is, is the idea of physical healing off the table just because of, no, not at all. Ask yourself a question. Did Jesus live, die, and defeat death just to pay the price of sin in terms of our eternal home? Or did Jesus live, die, and defeat death to pay for our physical healing in this life? Because if he only paid for heaven, why does he leave us here? If it's only about what happens when we die, then why is the majority of the New Testament written about how we live our life now? There has to be a reason. So there's more in that substitutionary death and, and burial and resurrection. There's more to it than just getting us ready for heaven. It has to do with how we live now. So I, I maintain that in that sacrificial work on Calvary, Jesus also paid for our physical healing. My reading of the New Testament indicates that salvation is a whole lot more than what a lot of church people think. Just grin and bear it. Oh, it's not an easy road. Oh, if I can just get through till tomorrow. Oh, you ever meet people like that? Yeah. Don't you love to hang around people like that? <laughs> you have to wonder why people don't want to come to church, right? <laughs> Be miserable now because someday, by and by, if you're a good boy, you'll get to be happy. No, no, no. Jesus died for a whole lot more than that. When we sing Jesus paid it all, what exactly did he pay for? What indebtedness did he pay when we sing Jesus paid it all? Was that just like what I did today or what I did up to this point in my life? Or was that everything? You know, there are people that live their lives, and I understand there's a ditch on either side of the road. I get it. But there's... There's extremes. The one extreme says, I had an impure thought. I got hit by a bus. I didn't confess it. I guess I'm lost my salvation. I'm going to hell. That's not biblical security. And there's the other ditch that says, 
I said to sinner's prayer and got baptized, and I'm going to live how I want. There's not a cotton-picking thing you or the Lord can do about it. And that's not right either. We stay on the macadam, and we find out that we are secure in our salvation. One ask me, which sin is worse than the other? What sin separates you from God? And we have to be honest, and we say rejecting Christ, right? Doesn't mean that God would like you to remain in a sinful lifestyle after you're born again. He wants you to live holy and all that. But we, we, we can't just say that Jesus paid for my sin from the moment I accepted him back, but not forward. And then we live our whole lives wondering, oh, am I good enough? And we've defeated the whole purpose of grace through faith. And we get that way too when it comes to healing. All the stuff I did in the past, I wrecked my body. I can't come before God. So he, he cleansed your spirit, but he can't cleanse your body. See, he wants us to understand things differently. I, <laughs> I don't understand all I know about this. I don't even understand all I know about the fact that there is a distinct work that the Holy Spirit does, the born-again experience, that I am changed from what I used to be to what I will be. And it's none of my work. I didn't take medicine. I didn't even fill out a paper. It's a supernatural work. I don't understand all I know about salvation. How, how everything in the past is gone and all things are become new. So if I'm okay with not really understanding how all that works but receiving it by faith, I believe that not understanding the idea of physical healing in its entirety, well, we have to treat it the same way. We, we go by faith. Not blind faith, but faith in the one who has an incredible track record. So, Christ has built into my born-again spirit, Christ has built into your born-again spirit the potential to be more like Jesus today than yesterday. He's built into our born-again spirit the potential to be more like Jesus tomorrow than today. And that seeking Him, that seeking to understand, that seeking to grow, that looking less like the world and more like Jesus, that's something that we, we, we stay at. We, we keep doing. We're not working our way in. We're just simply coming before Him and saying, teach me some more. Got to come with open hands. Open hands. I have nothing to bring to this. And it helps us live with some things that don't make sense, like childhood cancer. Right? But there's no five second answer to the question. It's a lifetime. Let's look at something here. I, I want to show you this morning that there are promises of Jesus that you don't have to think about. And there are promises of Jesus that you do have to think about. And I think you'll notice that these are in varying degrees of, hmm. So the first one is this, from John six thirty seven, the words of Jesus. The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. And we say, hallelujah, right? No matter where I've been, no matter what I've been through in the past, I know that I can come just as I am without one plea, right? But that thy blood was shed for me. We bring nothing to the table except our, our sinful self. We say, thank you, Jesus. That's a promise that all of us have had to embrace if you've decided to follow Jesus. If you're born again, you've embraced this, that it's perfectly within the will of God that we come, Right? So the second thing here, from Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He was getting ready to ascend back to the Father. 
and he was 10 days away from the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost. He says, yeah, I'm going away, but at the same time, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And we can embrace that. and We say, yes, I thank God that he's not left me alone. I thank God that I can sense his presence. I can feel his presence in my life. Number three from John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Why? Because he's the only one who ever lived the life that qualified him to be the propitiation for our sin. Fully God, fully man, never sinned, right? All of these things we talked about this morning, especially around communion. And we can embrace that and say, yes, I can handle that promise. I believe that. I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life from John 8, 12. We're starting to turn a corner now because we think, yeah, but I have walked in darkness. And we have to start seeking God about this promise because our real life experience does not always line up with that. There are times you think, I felt like I was in darkness. And granted, that's on us. That's on us. And you've come out of that darkness and you've come back to Jesus and you can take that verse and you say, yes, that is a promise that now I understand. You may not have understood it before, but now you do. Yes, he has, he has made a way that we don't have to walk in darkness. That's this life. Amen? That's this life. Let's keep going. From John 17, what we call the high priestly prayer of Jesus. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's us. Mm -hmm. Jesus prayed for you. Jesus prayed for me. Before he went to the cross. He knows all about you. Number six, this was difficult for the disciples to handle. Very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Guarantee you, his disciples before Calvary and Pentecost, when they heard that, it didn't make sense. They couldn't embrace that promise because they said, how can this be good? Because we've had three and a half years of walking with you physically. Now you say you're going to leave us. They're going to kill you, and you're saying it's good that you do that? They found out later, though, didn't they? On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent, then they understood this promise of Jesus. So the promise was n not any less true before Pentecost as it was after, but their perception of it had changed. Number seven, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father, John 14, 12. There are some people that don't know that verse is in the Bible, and they go to church. How dare you say that you're going to do even the same works as Jesus, greater works, whether that's in uh, magnitude or in numerical, doesn't matter either way. That speaks to a promise that most people who go to church never receive. They never receive that. And, and they'll cloak it in false humility. When there are things that God has intended for us to walk into with absolute assurance that we are in His will. It's getting a little harder as they go along, aren't they? How about this? From Mark 11, 23, 24, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. I've never spoken to a mountain and watched it move. But I believe what the Word says. Amen. That in the right situation, walking in the will of God, should that prove to be necessary, I believe what the Word says. Do I understand all I know about that? Sure don't. 
do I believe that before I see Jesus face to face, that he may ask me to speak to that mountain, tell it to move? Yes. There again, two ditches. We get off one side and we name and claim things that aren't in the will of God. But I would, I would propose to you that most Christians do not spend as much time in that ditch as they do the other one where we try to explain this away to allegory. Well, he didn't really mean the mountain. He meant, okay, well then let's look at the context that is in. Can you curse a fig tree and have it die? Because that's what the context. Well, he didn't really mean, let's not stay in either ditch. This one, last week, we talked about this from Mark. 16, 17 to 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. And as I shared last week, and I'll reiterate today, Jesus wasn't saying to his disciples, if you. He was saying, those who believe. That's us. There's an authority for this. And as we look through these words of Jesus, we started out going, absolutely, yep, I can receive that. And as we went along, we start, we start wondering, because what we see doesn't always line up with the Word of God. Is it possible, is it possible that we spend too much time being informed by what we see rather than being informed by what the Word of God says. Because a works-based mentality can also translate into what we see. Because we look at the work of our hands, we can see that. I moved that pile of dirt from here to here. I can see it. I accomplished something. So it's not just seeing the works of God. We can translate it into seeing the works of our own flesh. Then we really get in trouble. But now we're comparing the Word of God and what God can do through us to what we can do in our own strength. And, and that the enemy would like nothing better than for us to feel absolutely helpless and only dependent upon what we can muster up in our own strength, talent, and good looks. Amen. When we face a crisis of faith, the tension between knowing something is from God, but not being able to quite comprehend or explain it. In that tension, don't let the tension send you back. That tension serves a purpose. It's to make you reach heavenward. There has to be a tension between belief and experience, or faith doesn't have a chance to grow. So when you come up to that point where what you're seeing with your eyes doesn't match what the Word is telling you, you know that God is able. You know that He is able, but you're not seeing it. Don't let that tension give you a, a faith crisis. It should push you forward to reach out to heaven. And to be honest, Lord, there are some things I know about you, but I'm just not seeing it right now. Right? It takes our our works out of the picture. It takes our own uh, talents and abilities out of the picture. And I think that's where God can take us and say, I get it. You're still walking around in flesh, but come to me. Stay reaching toward me, and I'll give you the answers that you need. As I'm reaching, I must realize that I can't achieve this by, my, by good works and righteousness, but only through Christ. That's why when we speak of spiritual gifts, they're just that, gifts. They're not spiritual merit points. Amen. They're gifts. And it's all God's work. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Read this last week. Read it again. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. 
to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. This is in the NASB. It's interesting that uh, this translation includes the plurality of the word gift. Gifts. It's charismata uh, speaking to more than one. Gifts of healing. I also think it's interesting that especially in this translation, it's the only one of the nine listed that actually translate the word gifts, the word gift. The other ones are uh, distinguishing and affecting and, and, and all of this, but these gifts, plural, of healing. It also comes up a little bit later on in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, z, two plurals, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. And then again in uh, verse 30, all do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? When we speak about gifts of healing and gifts of tongues, there's a common identifier. Last week we talked about praying and speaking in tongues, about the threefold uh, biblical use of praying in tongues. And here healings is very similar because all believers are encouraged to pray for one another to be healed. James chapter 5, call upon the elders of the church. What's that mean? Those who have experience with God, those who are mature in their faith. And we're going to do it here a little bit later on today. We anoint with oil as a sign of the Holy Spirit, according to James 5, and we anoint them symbolically and pray. And all believers are encouraged to pray for others to be healed. But yet there are some who are given gifts of healing. There are some who are used in gifts that go beyond just what every believer does for one another. And the commonality we have here with tongues is that we know that there are many who pray in tongues in their private uh, edifying themselves or as a, a sign of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There are also those in a public worship setting who are used to bring a message of tongues. And not everyone in church is used to bring a message in tongues. Not everyone in the church is used in gifts of healing, but yet we are all to pray for one another. So not only do we have to adjust our thinking as far as healing when we don't see healing come, now we have to understand that it's entirely possible that God wants to use me to minister healing to someone else. I mentioned either last week, whenever it was, last week, I think. Many good prayers have been ruined by the phrase, if it be thy will. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear that it's God's desire that we operate in this. If, if he has commanded us to pray for one another to be healed, and not only that, he gave a, a, a charismata, a gifts of healing that he appointed some that they would just have that extra something. Hard to describe. There are people that have had healing ministries through the years, and, and they can't understand it, but it just seems like God used them in incredible ways, and, and we see it today. There's a gentleman uh, by the name of, well, lost my place. That's what happens when you get off your notes. There's a gentleman, L. Thomas Holdcroft. He's a Pentecostal theologian, Bible teacher from Canada. And I read a, an article that he had written. And uh, the title of it was The Gift of the Gifts of Healing. And he maintains that in the 1 Corinthians 12 mention of gifts of healings, that it was a gift of gifts of healing. And in this article, he goes on, and I, I kind of like what he says. He says that there are, seem to be some that have a gift of healing for cancer. There are some that seem 
God seems to use in opening blinded eyes. There are others that have been used in hearing. I remember uh, hearing that Oral Roberts prayed for many people to be healed and saw fruit, but he could not pray for people to be healed of deafness. It was, it was one thing that, that God had not used him and he didn't have the faith for. That kind of lends credence to this thing of the gift of the gifts of healings. On top of that, there are many different physical healings that are needed. What about our whole being? What about, what about healing of the mind? What about healing of our emotions? You know, John Alexander Dowie, he was an interesting piece of work, if you get to read a little bit about him. You know, God uses some strange people. And uh, uh, just because you start well doesn't mean you end well. Just because you start bad doesn't mean that you end bad. John Alexander Dowie uh, had healing rooms in Chicago, late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, God no doubt used him in some pretty miraculous things. He, uh, toward the end of his life, thought he was Elijah and got really crazy. Uh, and uh, in, in history books, that seems to undo uh, the good stuff. But I remember reading an account that when they had big church in Chicago, and when they had services, they would spread out tarps and sheets at the altar, and they would pray for people. And they had to have the sheets because of all the tumors that fell off. And every week they took it out and burned it. You know, th this is not that long ago, folks. There are miracles today. It seems like, especially in parts of the world where they have no option but to believe for divine healing. Amen. Used to be that goiters was a big thing. Uh, with our nutrition and iodine and things we know now about, goiters are not as big of a problem as they used to be. But in the, the healing revivals of the 40s and 50s, that was a big thing. People, and they would sit there and watch them. They would totally disappear. We were at the Thrive uh, Minister's Retreat the other week, and the speaker got up and told a story about a woman that he prayed for. She had lung cancer. And she coughed, and she coughed up the tumor. Wow. He said, this is kind of, he said, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And he said, it sounds disgusting, but we kept it. Took it to her doctor. He said, yep, that's what I saw on the inside through the x-ray. I, I know that God chooses to use people in miraculous ways. The healing power is not in the person. It's God's healing. But there's, there are just some that seem to understand and 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 have a, a gift in this way. Isaiah 53, we read about the suffering servant. And 700 years before Jesus walked the earth, Isaiah 53 describes his life and his death and what he would accomplish. Part of that chapter says, by his stripes we are healed. And we can take that healing to mean everything, right? Uh, I think in that context, it's actually speaking more of the, 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 the sinful condition we're in, that he provided healing from sin sickness. But it doesn't stop there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter reiterates this from, from Isaiah 53, but he changes the tense of the verb just a little bit. And he says, by his stripes we have been. We have been. We are healed. That says to me that when Jesus was on the cross, the payment was made. For us to agonize over whether it's God's will is a waste of time. He has paid for it. That would be the equivalent of saying, I'm not sure that, that I can be saved. And most people don't agonize over that. Some might. We don't have to understand it all. I don't understand it all. But I firmly believe that Scripture says that Jesus accomplished the privilege of physical healing. And he gave his perfect body on the cross. 
We know in his earthly ministry, he healed all who were oppressed. Healing was a major part of his ministry, and every time it talks about people coming to him, it says all were healed. Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, on fire, right? Shortly after the day of Pentecost, probably a couple days, they walk downtown, and there's this guy. Been sitting there all his life, lame, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. They've had that, that baptism of fire, and they know that they don't have to pray about it. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to study about it. They know God's will is for healing. And they come up to this guy and say, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And he jumps up. Never before walked, his legs were instantly strengthened. And the Bible says he jumped to his feet. They didn't even pray about it. They said, in the name of Jesus. It's a whole lot more available to us than what we think. I don't understand all I know about that. But I choose to believe the Word of God over my emotions. I choose to believe the Word of God over manifestations to the opposite that we've all experienced in our lives. Healing is not just needed for the body, but for the soul, for our heart, our emotions, our mind, all of those things. But this plurality of the noun, gifts of healing says to me that God's desire is to use spirit-filled men and women and sometimes boys and girls to minister in all of these areas. That God desires us to be well, so much so that in addition to healing, uh, being available and uh, encouraged for believers to pray for one another, He has divinely and sovereignly chosen some to operate in this special charismata, the special gift of the Spirit, a special gifting of being able to administer healing, not by their own power, but kind of a conduit for God. We always are in a hurry to add the caveat. Yes, but. And, okay, yes, but. We don't always know the whole story. We can't, by our own sheer will, make somebody be healed. There has to be, uh, we're, we're cooperating with God. We can't walk around and just say this, 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 and claim authority. I understand that. But we spend more time there than we do just saying, all right, I'm just going to walk in obedience to this. Every single person here, your pastor included, has a lot to learn on this. But you know what? I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going after everything that God has and wants for me to do. There's too many people that it's more comfortable and easy just to say, all of these miraculous gifts have ceased. They've all ended. They can't give you chapter and verse for it, but they've determined that they've all ended. Well, it's more convenient, because then you don't, have to, you don't have to struggle over the dichotomy, the things that don't make sense, that you know one way, but you're not necessarily seeing. It's easier just to say, well, that was for then, this is now. But I see nothing in God's character and nature that would indicate that he's changed his mind about these things. What, what, what has changed about God? What has changed about Jesus, who the Scripture says is the same yesterday, today, and forever? What has changed since Scripture was completed? Well, we have changed. The earth has changed. Society has changed. Uh, the heart of men and women have changed. There's probably not the same amount of fervor that a lot of people, when they decide to follow Jesus, I think more today they put conditions on that, I'll follow Jesus as long as it's sunny out, right? Whereas we can look back in the book of Acts and see people that were saying, I'll leave everything. 
I'll eat everything. I'm gone, right? But that, that's just us. I don't see how God has changed. If it's God's will that we be healed, it's God's will that, that we have abundant living in this life. I see nothing in the Word of God that that ever changed. So rather than taking the easy road out and just kind of copping out and say, oh, well, I'll understand it better by and by, why not go ahead and invest the time and be willing to work through that tension? Sometimes people start working on something and they give up because it got too hard. Sometimes people do that with getting an education or, or learning to do something new. It's just too much of a learning curve. I, I just can't do it. And they give up and they fall short. What about experiencing and accepting that tension between belief and experience, the things we don't understand? What if we didn't give up? What if we stayed at it? What if we honored God in everything? What if we did not spite God whenever something didn't go our way? My spouse died. Kids have cancer. Things didn't work out the way I thought. And a lot of times, people are like that young lady I met on campus. They're just angry at God. They don't understand why God would do that. And I'm telling you that God has already done all of this. And he's already made all of this possible. Could it be that we're the ones that just don't quite understand it? So go ahead and allow that misunderstanding. Go ahead and allow that tension. But as you're doing that, be sure to give honor and glory to God. Because he's right. He's right. Get an attitude where you stop praising him, you're never going to understand it. You take an attitude that says, even though I don't understand what's going on, I'm going to honor him, and I'm going to praise him. If Jesus paid it all, he paid for all of that too. I want to do something to, today, and actually, I think maybe we'll, we'll take a moment to uh, say goodbye to our online audience. There are times... For the people that are in the room, there are things that do not translate to the camera. And there's, there's kind of a, a security in knowing that the rest of the world is watching us. Um, because I'm going to ask you to do some things that might be a little different. I gave you a warning. Don't get nervous. Uh, you, still have, you still have the choice of doing or not doing what I'm going to suggest we do. It's a bit of an exercise. But before we leave, are we, we still have our audience? We don't? 